brand new uh, series that we're beginning today, the title of today's message, and the title of this series of messages is The, the Amazing Christmas Story. And it really is an amazing Christmas story, but if you're not careful, what ends up happening is we move past the amazement of the Christmas story and we just move into the Christmas season. And I want us to re- be reminded in the next four messages, three between now and Christmas, and then the fourth one being on Christmas Eve, I want to remind us of how important what Jesus did through his birth. Do you know what he did? Do you know why it's amazing? And so today's title of this amazing Christmas story is Why? Why is it such an amazing story? And do you know why it's an amazing story? So today, I'm going to talk about why it's an amazing story. Next week, I'm going to talk about, did you know that Christmas has a reward to it? And we're going to talk about that next week. And then the following week, I'm going to talk about seven characters that surround the Christmas story. And I'm going to tell you why, why each of them was so important to the story. I'm going to tell you what, uh, why it's important to the Christmas story. So we're going to talk about that on, on the Sunday before Christmas, all right? So if you have your Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn to two passages of Scripture. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. And then once you find your place there, make it real simple on you today, eventually we're going to make our way down to Matthew chapter 16, all right? So Matthew chapter 1 is where we'll begin. Uh, Why don't you read this with me there uh, in your version. I'm using the New American Standard Version. Verse 18 says, "Now Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with Notice this, with child by the Holy Spirit. And that's very important to the story. We'll come back and talk about that. But if you're highlighting or underlining, this would be a good little part to understand, okay? And then verse 19 says, And Joseph, her husband, was being, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. In other words, she, he found out she was pregnant, but it wasn't by him, but she, he, did, he was a righteous man. Didn't want to, because if he brought it out publicly, guess what? Going to have to stone her, because that was the day and time that they lived. But he, wanted to, but he, being a righteous person, wanted to redeem her, but didn't want to keep her. You can just think about why you wouldn't want to either. If you found out that uh, your, your bride, who you were betrothed to, you were engaged to, you found out she was pregnant, but it wasn't by you, what would you think, right? And so he wanted to do it secretly. So verse 20 says, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been, watch these words, conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Very important words to this amazing Christmas story, all right? And if you're, if you're keeping track, highlight that, underline it. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And just to bring you a little note there, if you're going to look at that word Jesus in Hebrew, it would be the word Yeshua, and Yeshua means uh, God who saves, or the God who saves, okay? So he's saying, Jesus, the God who saves. You're going to name him the God who saves, all right? Jesus, that was his name. In fact, just think about it like this. Uh, you know, so they're coming to a Jewish culture who was living among a Roman culture. And so when the Romans would have mythological gods, they would name them based on what they could do, right? And so what is this God who is coming in flesh, what, was, what could he do? He's the God who who could save. Are y'all following that? So he says he's the God who can save. Verse 22, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin, and and I've highlighted that in my Bible, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then the Bible tells us what that translated means. What Emmanuel means is God with us. So I want you to get that. So it is God with us, Emmanuel. I should call his name Emmanuel, God who is with us. Okay, where did that come from? Where did, they, where did this whole idea come from? All right, so I want you just to think with me for just a second. Do you realize the amazing part of the Christmas story is that in the entire world, the entire world is centered around the Christmas story. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but the entire world is centered around the Christmas story. Just think about this for just a second. There is an error that was before Christ came that when you would name it, if it was 100 years before Christ came, you would say it was 100 
B.C. And B.C. means before Christ, right? And then after Christ came, you would say A.D. And someone says, oh, that's after death. No, it can't be after death. I just want you to get that because if it were after death, that would mean there would be 33 and a half years of Jesus' life that were not accounted for. We didn't count them. So A.D. does not stand for after death. It stands for Anno Domini, all right, which means the year of our Lord. Okay, what was the year of our Lord? Year one, the year of the Lord when Jesus was born. So the whole world is centered around B.C. and A.D., 2012. Listen, if you don't know this, the culture and the world today are doing their very best to try and eliminate that there was ever a Jesus. I don't know if you know that or not. So in 2012, uh, people came together and said, you know, it's not good that the whole world observed before Christ and, and observed the year of our Lord. It's not good that the whole, I don't care what culture you come from, it's not good that the whole world observed this. Let's change it but let's be careful how we change it. Let's change it in such a way that it will not alarm Christians. So they, they went in 2012, and now people are observing not B.C., they're observing B.C.E. And it's not before Christ. It's actually before the common error. And then after they get rid of A.D., because you can't have A.D., because that would be Latin for the year of our Lord. So we've got to get rid of that, and they observe C.E., the common error. Okay, what does it all point to? Before the common area area is before Christ and after that is called the common error which is when Jesus came okay there's a new common error that I'm just going to tell you you can do everything you can do to try and bury the truth and yet it's going to keep coming to the surface it's going to keep coming to the surface and so the whole world observes this and you may not even realize it so today is uh, 2019 AD let me let me say it a different way this is the year of our Lord 2019 this is the year of the Lord. So I don't know if you think about this. As we're going into the Christmas season, we are celebrating the year of our Lord 2019 years later. We're still celebrating that. And we're going to continue to celebrate that. Well, where did this idea come from? So here in, in Matthew and in, ch in chapter 1 and in verse 23, it says these amazing statements. It's a quote out of the book of Isaiah. And it says, Behold, the virgin shall bear a child, uh, shall, uh, shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's a direct quote out of the book of Isaiah. Well, I want to kind of bring your attention to that, and you can look at it if you want. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 7 just real quick. But let me give you some background behind it. So there's a king. His name is Ahaz. And so just so you know, Ahaz was not a godly king. Are you all with me on this? So I'm just going to tell you, God has chosen through time to use godly kings and through time chosen to use ungodly kings. In fact, here's the reality. I don't care who you are. You can be the most ungodly sinner in the world and God can still choose to use you. And you can be a godly person and God choose to use you. Let me say it another way. God has a plan and a purpose for every one of you whether you choose to be godly or not. But so there was an ungodly king, his name was Ahaz, and so the Assyrians were getting ready to come down and to take over Israel. And he knew that, but he was doing everything he could do to try and save his own skin. And so the Bible tells us that uh, he was besieged. There were, so a be, if you, uh, besieged is a fancy word of saying they were setting up the sieges. In other words, they were setting up the walls. They were getting ready, preparing for this assault by the Assyrians. And so he, but he was already thinking to himself, if I do this, then maybe the Syrian, Assyrians will spare my life. And what he really, his plan was, I'll sacrifice all of Israel as long as I get saved in this process. And so he was doing things his own way. And so Isaiah came to him, and I want to pick up there in chapter 7 and in verse 10 it says, Then the Lord spoke to, again to Ahaz, saying, by the way, he was speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was telling him this. So the Lord began to say to Ahaz, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heavens. Okay, I just want you to pause right there. So he says, why don't you just ask me for a sign about what you should do? Why don't you ask me for some direction in your life? And then Ahaz makes what sounds like a very godly answer, but the reality is a very ungodly answer. Verse 12 says, but Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Doesn't that sound godly? And I just want to say, throughout history, throughout time, there have always been religious answers that have been ungodly answers 
just want you to get that. We put up a sign a few years ago around Christmas time and took a lot of flack around the area and there was a billboard that said, not religious, neither are we. And boy, we got it. I mean, people just got, man, it's like, you know, boy, you, you want to find out who the religious people are, put up a sign that says not religious. And so my statement to them was, we're not trying to go after the religious people. We're saving those for you. So anyway, so. But there's always been religious people. And I just want you to say, I'm trying to understand Christianity in its purest sense is not religion. It's not religion. Please, please hear me, because religion says if you can do this, then you can get in on this. It's a contract. But listen, Christianity is not a contract. It's a covenant. God says, regardless of what you do, if you'll believe in me, you get in. Amen. That's, that's great news. So Ahaz has this religious answer. He says, I will not do it. I'm not gonna do, I will not test the Lord, my God. I'm not going to test him. But the Lord said, why don't you test me? Are y'all following this? So verse 14 says... Uh, verse 13 says, then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? So here's what was really going on. Isaiah's trying to be, reveal it. Really, here's the reality, Ahaz. The reason you won't test the Lord is, is that if he gives you a word about what you're supposed to do, then you're responsible to keep that word. In other words, Ahaz didn't want to have to trust God for his future. He wanted to trust his own means of saving his own skin. So verse 14 says, therefore, and this will be the sign, therefore the Lord God himself will give you a sign. Watch this sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, isn't that an interesting sign that's going to be to Ahaz? Okay, if you're not picking up on this. 740 years before a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. 740 years. He says, Ahaz, I want to give you a sign. And the sign is going to be in 740 years from now. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you begin to think about it. Because you go, Ahaz is not going to see this sign in his lifetime. Right? Okay, Get this, a, what the Bible was trying to say is, Ahaz, you're going to have to trust God just like the rest of the world is going to have to trust God. You're going to have to trust Him for what you cannot see. That's the reason why the book of Hebrews makes this really interesting statement. It says that we today have what's better than what they had then. You know why? Because they had to believe God that He would send one day. We have something better today where we get to look back and know that we have already received what he said. Does that make sense? So we do have something better, but the, here's the reality. In that day and time, they still had to, by faith, believe. And the same thing is true today. By faith, we have to believe. In other words, what's, what Isaiah was saying is, you need to learn to trust God even if you can't see it. Are you all following that? By the way, I just want you to understand Although I have never, I never got to see the physical birth of Jesus Christ. By faith, I still have to believe that it occurred. Are y'all seeing that? So what's amazing about the story? The amazing part about the story is we all have to have faith. We all have to believe. Every one of us have to believe this. But there's some things that I think are very, very important to this. Something, there are two things that I think, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say it another way. I love theology. How many of you love theology? How many of you even know what theology is? <laughs> All right. So uh, theology is theos is God, and ology is the study of. So it's really the study of God. I love the study of God. And I'm going to tell you, there are, there, if, if, it's like uh, Lisa has been uh, working on a puzzle at our house now. She likes to, how many of you like to do puzzles? Y'all know what I'm talking about? So Lisa likes doing these puzzles. So she, she has this 2,000-piece puzzle that's been sitting on our table for like, I don't know, it's probably not been that long, but it feels like three months. But anyway, so, but she's been working on this puzzle. This week, we completed the puzzle. And it's exciting that we completed this puzzle. When I say we, she completed the puzzle. And as it got close to the end, and I can see where the pieces went, I jumped in and helped a little bit. So that's really the story of that puzzle. And so, it, interesting, we finished the puzzle, and we had this, uh, Anna just had to, we lost uh, in the last year, we lost both of our two dogs that we have, and I was fine with that, but my daughter wasn't, so she had to go and buy herself a new dog. So we have a puppy 
running around the house. And so, you know, when we finish the puzzle, what do you discover? <clears throat> pieces missing and pieces chewed. So anyway, so, but we finished the puzzle this week. And I was thinking, this is a lot about if you don't put the right pieces in the right spot, it'll mess up the entire puzzle. Well, in theology, I want to give you two puzzle pieces that will help to complete the entire picture. And by the way, the Word of God is like a puzzle, and you have to be able to know how to pick this piece and pick this piece and realize these pieces are talking about the same thing, and these two pieces fit together. Okay, so I want to give you, in my opinion, probably the two most important pieces in the puzzle to understanding theology. Are y'all with me on this? So I want to get, again, when I say theology, don't glaze over, okay? Because I'm telling you, as a Christian, it's the, probably the most important pieces in the puzzle. Y are y'all understanding that? So let me give them to you, right? So two important pieces in the puzzle. Here's p puzzle piece number one, okay? And that is, when Jesus came, he came 100% as God. Jesus came as God. So what I'm going to say, so it's very important you understand that Jesus was God. Okay? We, by the way, we live in a culture today where people will tell you, well, I believe there was a man. Uh, he was probably a good man. Uh, he, he may have been one of the prophets, but he was just a man. Listen to me very carefully. Jesus was more than a man. Jesus was God. Amen. He was God. And if you miss that piece of the puzzle, you're not going to understand the rest of the picture. And I'm going to give you some verses today to help you understand that a little bit. All right? So uh, Jesus came as God. Matthew chapter 16 you may remember, and, and someone actually asked me this question this week. They said, what, uh, in Israel, where is your fa favorite place to go in Israel? I've been 13 times to Israel. My favorite place to go is a place called Caesarea Philippi. Okay, at Caesarea Philippi is where Jesus asked this question that I want to read about in Matthew 16. Okay, I want you to pick it up with me. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, watch this, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And by the way, when God asks these questions, it's not that he doesn't know who he is. He's, by, G Jesus doesn't ask questions because he needs to know the answer. He's asking the question to find out, do you know the answer? So he says, when you ask society, when you ask the world, who do they say that I am? What, are, what do they say? What are they saying out there? By the way, you can ask this question today. You ought to ask your friends this. When you know, when just ask them. You know, you, you say, "Well, I already have the answer. I don't need to ask." No, just ask. Jesus asked these questions. Who do you think Jesus was? Who do you think that he was? Who do you say that he was? Just ask those questions of people. And so they begin to answer that question. They said to him, verse fourteen. Some say he must be John the Baptist. Others said maybe he's Elijah. But still others say maybe he was Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Maybe he was Isaiah. Okay, so they, they didn't know who he was, but they knew that he must be great. They understood that. Okay, listen, I'm talking about the world. Listen to me very carefully. The world knows that Jesus was great. In fact, something interesting is I looked up BCE this week as I was looking up, figuring out where that came from and what the, the construct was behind it. A whole article on why we changed it to BCE was because BC wasn't inclusive of every person in the world. Let me just remind you, for God so loved the whole world, okay? So it is inclusive of every person in the world, so that you understand that. God so loved the whole world. And then they go on to say in the thing, plus, uh, it's kind of a, it may be just a myth that Jesus ever existed. Okay, to make that stupid statement means that you're not denying God's word, you're denying historical writings. This man did exist, so please hear me about that. So he says, who do people say that I am? Verse four, and by the way, I believe that there's this hidden thing in our culture today of everything. And when you see these crazy decisions that are being made, it's being done to try and undermine the word of God. Please hear me. You need to, uh, I watch politics. I love watching politics. In fact, I will probably talk a little politics in January. How many of you are excited about that? Don't really care if you're not, just telling you. But in January, I've got a whole series called Offended. And I'm going to offend some of you. You need to show up. So anyway, so, by the way, I find that offended people are typically people who aren't right. 
So if you don't show up, I'm going to know you're not right. So anyway, so. <laughs> but just think about, I, and I, I love watching politics, and just, I just want you to know that even politics today, things that are happening, political, are trying to undermine that there is a God and that the Word of God is right, and we want to try and prove to you that it's wrong. And what they keep proving is that it's right. Over and over again, they keep proving that it's right. They don't even realize that this is what they're doing. So uh, he says, who do they say that I am? Well, he just was probably some good man somewhere. So Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, I want to say something very clearly to you. Every human being is going to have to answer that question. Now, you might be wrong, or you might be right. But every human being will have to answer that question. Who do you say that I am? And you need to answer that. You need to begin to answer that question. And by the way, this reason why I'm talking about that Jesus was God. Because we have to answer the question, who was he? Was he just a good man or was he God? And then I want you to notice the next statement. Simon Peter says, you are the Christ. In other words, Christ is the word Messiah or the word... Hamashiach in Hebrew, which means the, literally means the Messiah, the one who was chosen before all time to be the one to come. You are the chosen one, the son of the living God. That's who you are. And then you may know the rest of the answer there. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, told you that. And then it was just a few lines later, where Peter, Jesus says, I'm going to have to go to the cross and I'm going to have to die for all people. And Peter says, oh no, Lord, we'll never let that happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So it's just interesting how the same mouth can come both blessings and cursing. How many know that's true? And so this is, he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. So listen, Jesus is God. Jesus came as God. Let me, let's go back again. If you're there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child, watch this, by the Holy Spirit. Please catch that. So important. And then in verse number 20 it says, But when he had considered this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here's what you need to know. Uh, Every other human who has been born has had the egg of the mother and the seed of the father. Is that right? Right, okay, except for Jesus. Jesus had the egg of the mother, but had a different seed of the Holy Spirit. Had the seed that came from the heavenly Father. It's a different seed than all the others. Why? Because the Bible says through, through one man, and that man being Adam. Remember, we've talked about this in the last few weeks, how important Adam is to the story. Through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. By the way, uh, you were born sinners. Every one of you. And I know some of you are all, not my precious little one. Not not mine, not mine. Every other one, but not mine. You watch. One day, your little precious one's going to lie to you, and no one's going to have to teach them how to do it. Because they were born with the seed of sin. Let me say it another way. They were born with a corrupted seed. Are you all catching that? But not Jesus. Because when Jesus came... He came as God, the Holy Spirit impregnated uh, Mary with a different seed, an incorruptible seed, a righteous seed, a holy seed. That's what makes Jesus different than you. That's what makes him 100% God. Are y'all following this? In other words, Jesus came as God in the flesh. And you'll understand this better when we close out this message this morning. So he came as God. In fact, let me just say this, very important. Because you were born of a corruptible seed, do you understand why Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, what what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, you must be born again. Is that right? Okay, born again of what? A different seed. An incorruptible seed. If you don't think that's true, let me just give you a verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Listen, you can't go to heaven unless you're born of an incorruptible seed. 
If you have a corrupted seed, which we all do, if you have a corrupted, you can't go to heaven. But when you get born again because you put faith in Jesus Christ, God rebirths you through his spirit to have incorruptible seed. Therefore, he can say, you weren't righteous, but because of my son, you are now righteous. Amen. Is that great? So we're born, or this is the way we're born. By the way, it's why it's important to understand that Jesus was God. Because only God could do that. A human being could never do that. If, if Jesus was merely a human, then just another human died. But he wasn't human. He was God. Did y'all catch that? So Jesus came as human. Here's number, excuse me, came as God. Here's number two. Jesus came as a human. Jesus came as a human. So let's, listen, say, how is that possible? I don't know. But I can tell you this, that he came 100% as God, and at the same time, he came as 100% human. At the same time. Now listen, only God could do that. You could never do that. You couldn't even plan to do that. But he came as 100% human. And by the way, it was important that he was also human. And I hope you understand that today. And again, these are two puzzle pieces that will help you to understand theology. And you have to have these right. So what, let me just give you a verse of Scripture. He, Jesus came as a human. John 1.1, 1, 1, and I think it's one of, and by the way, so you understand, Matthew chapter 1 gives us the Christmas story according to Matthew. Luke chapter 2 gives us the Christmas story according to Luke. Most people think they're the only Christmas stories in the gospel. But John 1.1 1, 1 is a different way to see the Christmas story. So here it is. In the beginning was the Word. Now that word, Word, is the word logos, and it, it refers to something more than just words. It's something bigger and deeper than just words. In fact, if you'll look in your Bible, you'll see that the word, Word, it's hard to talk about words that are Word, but the word, Word, is capitalized because this is a different kind of Word. So it says, in, and, and, and so who is this Word? And it says, in the Word, he says, uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I want you to catch this. It's so important. Because if this truth is not right, listen, we are to be pitied among all people. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, we've had, in fact, we have quite a few people who used to be in the Jehovah's Witness faith who've now come to faith in Jesus, the real Jehovah. And so, but this verse right here, uh, it used to be Jehovah's Witnesses would use the King James Version Bible, but then because it didn't fit their theology, they came out with their own edition of the Bible. And here's what this says in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and they changed this little word, and the Word was a God, little g. Listen to me, Jesus was not a little g. Jesus was God. Please hear me. It's so important we understand that. Because if you miss this, all of your theology will fall apart. It's important we know that Jesus was God. So the Word, and I'm going to tell you, someone says, well, how do you know that the Word was Jesus? Okay, drop down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh. God, the Word, became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is the one and only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now listen, this is very, very important. By the way, I, and this may blow some of your theology, but Jesus was not born on December 25th. I know it's going to blow some of your theology. Most likely, Jesus was born at Sukkot, or another way to say that is the Feast of Booths, or another way to say that is the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, catch this. Let me read it again. This is the Christmas story. And God was born. Just look at verse 14. I'm reading it a different way, but I need you to catch this. And God was born and tabernacled among us. And we saw in the year of our Lord his glory. The glory as of the only begotten, John later says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, begotten from the Father, and from the moment he was born, he was full of grace and truth. Is that an incredible, just want you to catch, that's the Christmas story. 
But someone says, well, if we're not celebrating his birth on December 25th, what are we actually celebrating? Okay, let me, let me help you. This is, this is King Mark version. So, Feast of Booth, King, uh, you know, uh, the, the Feast of Tabernacles happens usually late September, early October. That's when it happens, okay? So, by celebrating on December 25th, what we're actually celebrating is his conception. You count the months up there. Okay, I'm just... I'm just going to tell you, life is important, and it begins at conception. I know you didn't come for that. I don't care. Because, listen, if we don't understand where life begins, we're going to miss it. Okay. Okay. That's good, isn't it? That's good. Okay. All right. So Jesus came as God. Yes. Amen. Jesus came as God, but he also, Jesus came as a human, 100% human. And it says that he became flesh. And let me say it another way, he became human. The word became human. That's who he became. He chose to take on human flesh. I'm going to explain why here, why that's so important. So let me just show you a couple other verses real quick, why it's important to understand this. First John 4 verse 2 says, but this you know, this you know, the Spirit of God. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come as a human in the flesh is from God. If Jesus didn't come as a human, then they're not telling you the truth. And this is true faith. This is the puzzle piece you need to know about theology, that he came as a human. And verse 3 says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Listen, the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And there is an an Antichrist coming, but the spirit of Antichrist is already here. And what is the spirit of Antichrist trying to teach? That Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Let me say it another way. God didn't come in flesh. And when Jesus came, he wasn't God. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the world we're living in today. You need to catch it. Because some of you think you're just living life thinking it's no big deal. It's a big deal. What's going on is a big deal today. And then watch this. Very next verse. I'm going to give you another one. Second, Second John verse 7 says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. That's why this is an important part of the puzzle. That you understand these two principles, that Jesus was 100% human and that Jesus was God. The assumption here is that Jesus is God and that Jesus came as flesh. That's the assumption. And when you can't confess those two things, you have the spirit of Antichrist on you. But listen, you don't have to stay there. You can come out from among that. Let me help you understand a little bit deeper. I love this. So Hebrews uh, chapter 2. Uh, by the way, Hebrews was a book, was a New Testament book. Uh, writ- Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to Hebrews to tell them if you keep living like Hebrews, you'll be nothing more than a Hebrew. <laughs> That's what that was. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm telling you because Hebrews, Jewish people also need to know Jesus as Savior. Please hear me. That's why it was written. So watch this. So Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 2, and I want to read this out of the New Living Translation because I just think it makes sense. It helps us to understand. It says, because God's children are human beings. Now I want to pause right there for real quick. Why was it important that Jesus come as a human? Okay, listen to me. Because if God comes and dies, it's not possible. Because God always is and always was and always will be. So it's not possible for God to die. So it was was important that Jesus be 100% human so that he could truly die. Are y'all seeing this? That's why it's important to understand these. So he says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. In other words... God couldn't die for your sins if he didn't become human. So you understand that? So for only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So he had to become human so that he could 
break this curse that was over every one of you. That's great news. And I'm just telling you, that's the amazing part of the Christmas story. That if he just showed up one day and wasn't born, uh, let, me, let me say it another way. Think about this. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points as you. Let me, in fact, let me read it. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Okay, listen to me. Whatever thing that you have been tempted with in your life, Jesus went through that temptation and didn't succumb to it. I, listen, I want you to think about this. Because we, as Christians, sometimes we think of the deep, dark things that we think are deep, dark sins. They're all sins. They're all sins. Listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus was tempted with homosexuality. Listen to me. That's the reason why you can be redeemed from homosexuality. Jesus was tempted. Listen, I'm telling you. Someone says, well, I don't know if he was tempted with pornography. Do you not know the Roman culture? Listen to me very carefully. There is nothing that Jesus, that you have been tempted with, that Jesus was not also tempted with. But here's the great thing. He didn't succumb to it. Because he had to be 100% human. Listen, some, someone says, well, you, you know, God, Jesus just doesn't understand what I'm going through. He doesn't know the hardship that I'm going through. Wrong. He fully understands it. And he knows how to have victory in the middle of it. Why would you not want to come to him and help, have a helper who can help you get through it? That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to us. That's why it's so important we understand he was 100% human. And he was also 100% God at the same time. Because he understands what you go through. He knows what you struggle with. He knows the difficulties that you're in. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, I want to show you one more place, and then I want to give you an illustration. Again, talking about the Christmas story, Isaiah 9-6. I think it's interesting. Pastor Lisa this morning did not know that I was going to use this verse. And she used this this morning to talk to us. So this is my last verse of today. Isaiah 9-6 says, and I want you just to see, he was 100% God and 100% human. For a child, Isaiah said, will be born to us. That's 100% human. A son will be given to us. And someone says, well, there's nothing there that says that he's God. And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Do you see he's mighty God? That he's 100% human, but he's also mighty God. Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. That's who he is. So I, I was thinking about this message and I was thinking about Adam and Eve in the garden, and I, I really think most everything goes back to Adam and Eve. And I'm, I'll hurry with this, but it's so important we catch it. What if, and again, I'm just, I'm just saying what if. It, did, it didn't happen this way. It did not happen this way. So I don't want anyone to come back and say, well, it didn't happen that way, Pastor. I know, it didn't happen this way. But what if Adam had not been with Eve on the day that she sinned? And that Adam chose not to sin with Eve. What would have happened? And I don't know, but I think there would have had to have been a conversation like this because God came down in the cool of the day to walk with Adam. Remember that? And so can you imagine he, ha he wasn't with Eve? Obviously, Adam was not omnipresent, nor was he omniscient. He, did, he wasn't in all places at all time. God was, but Adam wasn't. And so maybe Adam was on this other side of the garden, and God comes down, and he walks with Adam. He says, well, Adam, I've got some bad news for you. He says, Eve, your wife sinned. Again, I, again, I'm just talk, giving a hypothesis of something that did not happen. Did y'all hear me? But if Adam hadn't been there, God would have had to come to Adam and say, I've, I've got bad news. Your wife, Eve, she sinned. And because she sinned, she's going to have to die. She's going to have to die. Can you imagine what would have gone through Adam's heart that day? Okay. I know that didn't happen, but listen, what? I, in my mind, I think there had to be a conversation of God the Father and God the Son on the day that Adam and Eve sinned. Because when God created Adam and Eve, He intended for them one day to be the bride of the Son. 
And can you hear the father saying to the second Adam, Jesus, his son, hey, I've got bad news for you today. Your wife has sinned. And I can almost picture Jesus saying, what? Uh, sinned? Why? Well, I don't know why they chose that. But because your wife, your bride has sinned, she's going to have to die. And I can almost hear Jesus saying, but I don't want her to die. God says, I'm sorry. When they sin, they'll have to die. So Jesus says, I'll become a human and I'll die for them so that they can live. Well, in a real sense, that's what Jesus did when he came to that manger in that little tabernacle, that little booth. Is he said, I'll become a human. I'll endure suffering just like they do. And I'll show them that it's possible to not sin. And that when I truly die, I will pay the price for them so that they can be bought back for me. Is that great? And it's also important to know that God didn't leave him dead. But God resurrected Jesus so that you could be married back to him. That's great news, isn't it? Father God, we love you. We thank you for what you did. This amazing Christmas story by you taking on 100% flesh and at the same time, 100% God. And we worship you. We worship you. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never met Jesus as your Savior. You know, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead, will be saved. That's the, hard, the, the hardest part you ever have to do is just believe. That's it. So if you've never done that, why not do that this morning, right where you're seated? You can just, in your hearts, pray a prayer just like this. Why don't you do it? In fact, if you're here today and you go, I'd like to do that, Pastor. I'd like to invite Jesus in my heart. Why don't you pray this prayer right where you're seated? Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth right now that Jesus is Lord of my life. And thank you, Father, for raising him from the dead, proving that you have the power over death, therefore the power to grant me new life. And from this day forward, you are my God, and I am your child. That's new birth. And just thank him. God, thank you for birthing me again, for giving me a new birth. Thank you for coming into my heart and saving me from my sins. Now, if you prayed that prayer this morning, here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm not going to embarrass you. I will not call you out. I'm just going to ask if everyone would just keep their eyes closed for just a moment because of the sacredness of this moment. If you prayed that prayer and you invited Jesus in your heart, would you just slip up your hand nice and high and say, Pastor, I did that. Would you pray for me? Anyone in this room today? I invited Christ in my heart. Amen. I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, in the back of the room, yes. Amen, over on my left, yes, I see you. Amen. You can just put it up and put it back down. Yes, on my left, I see you. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of you. Way over on my right, I see you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say one last prayer. And when I finish that prayer, if you need prayer for any reason, we want to invite you to come. If you invited Christ in your heart this morning, why not come and tell someone today? I just want you to know I, I invited Jesus in my heart. We have some. If you invite Christ in your heart today, we have a free gift for you we'd like to give you. If you don't have a Bible, we have a Bible for you. And, uh, it, and we have a book that helps you to understand some of your next steps in your life that you need. And if you need prayer for a marriage situation or for a family situation or a job situation, we want you to come for prayer. 
and let's put Jesus back in the middle of things again. Are you ready? By the way, prayer time is not just for life fellowship people. Prayer time is for every human being. So if you need prayer, come. Father, we love you. Thank you for every decision made in this room today. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory for people, for human beings coming into the family of God in this place. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's worship this King of Kings and this Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus.